institutional capture with regard to academia. The way you talked about it, it sounded like people will be shocked to hear that academia has, has become captured. <clears throat> and in fact, you know, most of our audience will be well familiar with that concept, um, but in a limited frame, right? In, uh, in, in the frame of grievance studies. Right. And also, you know, administrators, you know, there, there are a lot of ways that people have begun to become familiar with the idea that actually higher ed isn't what it's supposed to be. And it's helping to destroy and make fragile, <clears throat> excuse me, and make fragile, um, you know, so many of the people who go through higher ed at this point. Uh, and indeed, uh, we, we have even, um, you know, year, years ago, a few years ago, uh, at the point that our friends, you know, the people who who did the grievance studies work, Peter Bogosian and Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay, were 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 doing that. We were saying, yes, for sure, we see that. We see we see the sort of the the bastardization of postmodernism from the '90s and those people coming around and you know becoming faculty now and indoctrinating rather than educating students. And it's a you know that's a big part of the explanation of what went wrong at Evergreen and what is, you know, the, all of the, you know, the, the big ridiculous kerfuffles on college campuses seem to be about that. But what we said then, and was harder to convince people of who aren't actually in the sciences was there is a different problem within the sciences. It's been brewing for longer. It's about the, the, the economic model of how scientists and um, scientists are funded and how institutions um, are funded by those scientists, therefore providing perverse incentives for scientists to only do, do big science, expensive science. And it has rendered scientists also, not just people with PhDs in fields that probably shouldn't exist, but many scientists incapable of actually doing solid careful evolutionary thought. And so credentialism, as it rises, where people say, well, you know, that person is a professor, that person has a PhD in a science, they must know what they're talking about. The number of people who actually have these degrees and were never expected, in fact, to get those degrees, to do a complete piece of research from beginning to end, to make an observation, to pose all the alternative, the possible alternative hypotheses, to figure out how you might address those hypotheses, what the predictions that are downstream of them are, and how you would address them, and what the experimental design would be, and go out and collect the data, and analyze the data, and figure out what it means, and reveal it, and communicate it both in speech and in writing. Many people don't experience that in order to get their PhD. They walk into someone else's lab with someone else's funding, with someone else's questions already on the table, and they do a little tiny piece. And why do we expect people like that to be able to think broadly about the entire scientific process and to walk in and say, actually, that, that doesn't make sense. Actually, actually. You know, when you, when you do um, widespread vaccination with non-sterilizing vaccines during a pandemic, there is likely to be a selective pressure for new variants to, uh, to start to spread. And this is something that we've talked about before that you had on Geert Vandenbush to talk about, has been talking about it. There's a paper that, that we cite in what we just published from 2015 that goes through the long established theoretical considerations for why to think that and the fact that there are lots of models out there that demonstrate it but then they also do the empirical work and they're looking at chickens uh, and they find indeed that um, the that non-sterilizing vaccines produce an environment uh, that actually helps the spread of new variants of 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 previously um unfamiliar and rare variants. So I want to go back to the the place that you started. I, I agree with everything you've just said. It's vital. But the, the piece I want to highlight okay. is the um, when the the um, the grievance studies work emerged, we actually did say to them, yep. um, the problem is, you didn't do this with the sciences also. And so you can't see that the that there is a parallel kind of corruption mm -hmm. in the sciences, that the scientific work is not pure and in contrast, right, the, the grievance study stuff is particularly egregious and obvious. It's transparently wrong. The problem is that the scientific stuff is cryptically broken. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, it's not just the fact that these people have been awarded a degree for work that doesn't actually make them expert in the way science is done because they've done too small a piece. That's a common problem. Mm -hmm. But there's also this issue, the same reason that people end up doing a very small piece of work in order to get their degree is that there's this incredible pressure that has to do with the way the university is, um, is paying for its, its work by effectively giving people degrees in lieu of money. That's how it makes uh, itself profitable. And so that creates this incredible pressure to do work that pleases those in a position of authority in order to, um, to get any hope of a job. And so what you get are these positive feedbacks where some bit of conventional wisdom, the school of thought that owns your field is in a position to make sure that only work that matches that school of thought and doesn't challenge it emerges. So it becomes anti-scientific. And until you've seen the effect of that corruption, you, it seems Im it's impossible to imagine. And frankly, that that truth about how science is funded and has been for decades at this point, at least in the in the Western world, certainly in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, and, and Canada as well, and I, I think more widespread than that, um, that necessarily preceded the rise in the grievance studies fields and the capture by them of uh, many university administrations, because scientists are encouraged to, and, I, and I've talked about this on a previous uh, on a previous episode, um, but because scientists are basically the the money makers for universities, because the universities get such a substantial overhead percentage of any grants that get brought in, um, they are given effectively scientists, um, academic scientists are given the gift of not having to do some of the other work that they would have to do. And broadly, there's three sorts of things that academics are expected to do. It's research, it's teaching, and it's governance. Um, governance meaning everything from sitting on the committee that decides who's going to do the catering for your campus, um, to admissions, to hiring, to decisions decisions about um, you know, restructuring of organizations, of, of you know, departments and, and schools within your campus, um, well, if the, if the money's coming in because of your research, you're not going to give uh, research, science a, research scientists a pass on the research, but you're going to start to minimize what they have to do in those other two camps. And so you give them fewer teaching responsibilities, which also means they have less and less interaction uh, with with students who are actually incredibly useful in terms of giving, yes, a bunch of naive pushback, but also a lot of sophisticated pushback because they don't know what questions they're not supposed to ask. So that's a drawback of being less exposed to the the teaching part of it. But it's even easier to say, okay, you you don't have, you know, the, the more money you bring in, the more focused you are on that, we understand you're busy, you don't have to do as much governance, which means that the governance positions are filled more and more. Um, there's, there's, um, there is representation within governance at many universities that is widely skewed towards non-scientists and towards people in fields that are actually not making any sense at all. And so all the grievance studies kerfuffle is actually downstream of this failure of scientists to continue to be scientists, but instead be captured by these economic forces. Right. And effectively, what we're saying is you can see the effect of capture inside the academy. And of course, it has a particularly academic look to it in that context. It looks very different than whatever takes place where lobbyists are persuading legislators to do things. But the point is, it's a variation on a theme. Mm -hmm. And one thing that just occurs to me at this moment is you and I have observed in traveling in other parts of the world, especially uh, developing nations, that one of the things that makes it impossible to govern these nations is that everybody is so pressed for resources that they're very cheap to corrupt, yeah. right? So you've got somebody who's in charge of forest policy in Madagascar, let's say, and they maybe they make 10,000 bucks a year, right? I don't know now, but it wasn't anything close to that. Let's the say 90s. they make 10,000 bucks. And let's say that uh, they're supposed to prevent you from logging some peninsula and there are tens of millions of dollars at stake in the lumber there. And the question is, well, how easy are they to persuade to betray their public obligation if it's going to actually enable them to, to you know, put their family on a, on a substantial footing? It's very hard to prevent that kind of corruption when people are, are not um, made immune by having decent salaries. And so 
this is exactly the case inside of uh, academia. You've got this incredible insecurity that comes from the fact that there aren't nearly enough jobs. And the fact is it causes people to be easily corrupted, even if that they don't understand what they're doing. There's no bribe on the table, but there are many, many other mechanisms. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, it's, it's not, a, it's usually not a physical thing, but it's offers of, of, of goodies, right. In, in academia. And I'm, you know, the, it will be obvious that it's a bribe when I say that when I was going through all of the normal channels and doing everything by the book, and I really wasn't cheating at all, and trying to get the permits that I needed to do the work I, I needed to do in Madagascar, I was asked um, by the person with the stamp, like literally it was a stamp, right? I remember us having to wait for three days to get into this room um, where the guy with the stamp was finally going to show up at the same time as the stamp. One day the guy wasn't there, the next day the stamp wasn't that. there. Yeah. The third day, like, well, the keys to the door weren't there and he was going to have to go in the way. I mean, it was, it, it was a comedy of errors, but actually true. Um, but, you know, I, I had done everything correctly. I was not trying to cheat the system at all. But um, and in a, in a different time when I was trying to get the permits for a different field season in Madagascar, I got asked for a Land Rover. Well, I was a graduate student making at that point, you know, $13,000 a year. And I didn't have a Land Rover, nor did I have any um, inclination to give the guy a Land Rover if I'd had one. Um, but he accepted in lieu of a Land Rover, a bottle of whiskey which I came back with the next day, Well, which I had to, right? We should like, also say so that, that, but that's an obvious set of, like, right, that, that's how obvious. we think it's going to look, but in academia, it doesn't look it doesn't, that way. It doesn't right? look that way. I should just say that yeah. the Land Rover sounds preposterous, except that we knew cases in which Land sure. Rovers had been used because some large Absolutely. project with a million dollar grant needed to get some stuff yeah, done. And, and you might as well ask. Right. So, yeah. yeah maybe right, she has the, a Land Rover. Right. So the, the <laughs> problem is that the corruption of science, which is, because it's subtle, it's very destructive because we can't even, it's very hard to even diagnose, like which stuff do you trust, right? That's, that's, a, that's a harder job than it should be. But the overarching corruption, anywhere where there's something at stake like money, right? Like this is liable to be much less of a problem in, uh, I'm going to find out that I'm wrong if I say geology because maybe uh, mineral resources. Mm, yeah. But if you, if, you know, presumably uh, astronomy is going to be better about the kind of corruption. It's going to have a kind of mundane corruption. Mm -hmm. And then things get really bad, as I discovered when I did the telomere work, as you get closer to medicine, sure. right? Things get really corrupt and messed up. But the, the, the overarching impact of that corruption of, in all of its forms is to render the science feeble, right? right? Which has a paradoxical weird effect that if you don't want to win in its terms is actually something you can make use of, right? It means that field after field, which is corrupted, are relatively easy to beat, right? If you're free of the influences that corrupt it, you can look in and you can say, this makes sense, that doesn't add up, and you can begin to, to follow uh, a pattern. And so what I would say is one of the things that I think we are faced with here is that in effect, we have no power, we are not telling you do this or don't do that. We are just simply talking about what we see. And uh, I'm sure some people are persuaded. I know lots of people aren't. I mean, we have conversations in, uh, in the Patreon discussions that I have once a month. We've talked about vaccination. I think almost everybody in those discussions is vaccinated, as we could have ended up vaccinated if we hadn't been paying attention to certain signals that became alarming a little quickly. 